Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our July 11th, 2014 webcast from LaRouchePack.com. My name is Matthew Ogden, and I will be your host tonight. And I'm joined by Megan Beats from the LaRouche Pack Science Team, Dennis Small from Executive Intelligence Review, and Diane Sayer uh, from the LaRouche Pack Policy Committee here in the studio tonight. Uh, we had a meeting with both Lyndon and Helga LaRouche earlier this afternoon, at which the questions that will be asked tonight were presented to them, so the answers that you hear tonight will reflect their comments. We're going to begin as we normally do with our institutional question, which reads as follows. Russian President Vladimir Putin called for better relations with the United States in a congratulatory message to President Barack Obama last Friday, marking U.S. Independence Day. He stated that he hopes that the ties between the two countries, which have a rich history, will continue to successfully develop on an equal basis despite the current dif differences and difficulties. Vladimir Putin also highlighted that Russia and the United States, as countries carrying exceptional responsibility for ensuring and safeguarding international stability and security, quote, should therefore cooperate not only in the interests of their own nations and for the benefit of their own peoples, but in the interest of the whole world. So the question is, in your view, what type of cooperation between the United States and Russia can contribute to this international stability and cooperation in the interest of the entire world, as President Putin has called for? Okay, thanks, Matthew, and good evening. Uh, what Mr. LaRouche said in response to this question when it was discussed with him today is that the United States essentially should be the paragon for this type of relationship among nations. And as the paragon, we must assume responsibility to ensure that such a community of principle among nations actually is created. He said, to do that, the first and most immediate thing that has to be done is that the United States has to return to its rightful role in the concert of nations. To do that, Barack Obama must be impeached, removed from office by constitutional means. In fact, Mr. LaRouche said, Obama should be impeached for that purpose. And that would then send the, set the standard for the honorable role that the United States must play today under the current conditions of crisis, bringing the nations of the world together around the common aims, aims of mankind and our common mission towards the future of mankind on this planet and beyond in the solar system and the galaxy. Now, with that change in the United States by removing Obama from the presidency, for reasons which we will discuss in the minutes ahead, we will be able, Mr. LaRouche said, to pull the world back from the brink of economic catastrophe and disintegration and back from the brink of threatened thermonuclear warfare. On the subject of wars, Mr. LaRouche said that to the wars already unleashed by the British Empire to try to bring the planet's population to heal and to threaten Russia and China with thermonuclear extinction if they don't go along with the British Empire's claim plan, we now have, on top of Ukraine, on top of Syria, on top of Iraq, uh, and so forth, we now have horrors being unleashed by Israel in Gaza on the instructions of the British Empire. Mr. LaRouche said, this is a hideous operation which is going on of Israel's under British direction. It's murder, predominantly of innocent women and children. And we cannot allow this to happen. Their policy is simply to kill people, just as the British Empire's broader policy is to kill off six out of seven billion people who are alive th to this day on this planet. Now, once we return the United States to its constitutional principles, uh, with Obama out of the way and out of the White House, which is a necessary precondition of doing that, other nations will unquestionably join us in this effort in the benefit of the common aims of mankind. Not only Russia, which is fairly straightforward, as is evident from the way Putin has handled himself inclusively in this July 4th message 
to our president and our nation. But China as well, uh, another one of the major Asia-Pacific powers that are moving forward today. And China, for example, is using all possible international fora to be able to discuss and call for the creation of a new world order based on mutual respect among nations. The Chinese argue that nations have common interests, not interests that are absolutely irreconcilably opposed one to the other. And that therefore what we must do as nations, they say, is to defend the interests of others as well as our own. They're making concrete economic proposals to bring this about. They're putting meat on the bones by giving examples of how this thing should actually work. For example, with their uh, plans for the building of the new Silk Road, which is already operational and underway, and which is an open-ended proposal with invitations for every country, not only on the route, but even so far off the route, to uh, participate in this. And the Chinese interest and the Russian interest in the Bering Strait Tunnel Project, which the LaRouche movement has uh, been promoting for many decades now, actually gives us an interesting an idea of the way in which the Silk Road could in fact be extended directly from the Eurasian land bridge across the Bering Strait into North America and down from there into South America through the Darien Gap, along with the necessary high-speed maglev train lines and so on and so forth. So projects of that sort, which the Chinese are proposing, uh, they're inviting all nations to be involved in this. They are creating an Asian infrastructure investment bank, which the United States has been invited to participate in. Uh, the United States government under Obama, uh, the State Department has expressed keen disinterest in this project, saying that it competes with the kind of guidelines that have been provided and are being put forward by the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank instead, such as green policies, which they say must be met, transparency, which is another matter of great concern, and what they call procurement, which I thought was something that had been monopolized by Strauss-Kahn at the IMF, but I guess not. So in addition to that, the Chinese are also have announced they are launching with the Nicaraguan government, the construction of an interoceanic canal, a kind of new Panama Canal, uh, through the uh, Isthmus of Central America in, in Nicaragua, which is going to create 50,000 jobs immediately in construction and up to 200,000 jobs in an area which is currently blighted by the policies going back to the Bush administration, the policies of Wall Street, the policies of the drug trade, which the Obama administration is now promoting by fostering legalization across the United States. The Chinese are going in instead with the idea of let's develop while the Russians are going into Central America, as we should be doing, helping those countries to fight the drug trade instead of legalizing the damn thing, uh, and where you have the uh, anti-drug czar of Russia, uh, Viktor Ivanov, explaining repeatedly that the only way to actually put an end to the drug trade is by applying the Glass-Steagall legislation internationally. That is to say, to separate commercial banking, productive banking on the one side from speculative banking on the other, because it is the drug trade that is behind the speculative banking and vice versa. So these are the kinds of options being offered. Now, this concept of society that the Chinese are presenting and which Mr. LaRouche is talking about in terms of the paragon that the United States must be is actually the concept of society and man set forth in the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, which was against the empire's idea of man as a beast, defending what our, the empire defines as his personal interests, usually his sectarian religious interests. How? by killing people from other sects. And if this strikes a striking resemblance in your mind to what's happening in Iraq and Syria today, well, it's because the same imperial policy, in this case of the British Empire, is actually operational. But the Treaty of Westphalia had the idea of sovereign nation states in concert with other nations whose sovereignty is not only respected, but promoted and developed by each and all. Now, this concept of the Treaty of Westphalia is, of course, uh, synonymous with the idea famously presented by Nicholas of Cusa uh, in the 15th century. As Helga Zeplerouche has repeatedly emphasized, and she stressed this point again today when we discussed this matter, 
where for Cusa, the maximum development of each nation and its culture and its contribution is in the interest and the benefit of all humanity. The idea that the development of the microcosm is not only in coherence with, but is necessary for fostering the maximum development of the macrocosm. Now, that is the concept on which the United States of America was founded, on which the Constitution was based, explicitly so. And it is now that Constitution and that history which is being violated up and down State Street by Barack Obama. And as LaRouche said, remove Barack Obama from the White House so that the United States can once again become the paragon among nations for such a world order as we wish to create. Well, let me follow up on that directly. Um, one week ago, Mr. LaRouche issued a policy statement which went directly to this point in which he said that the foremost national and international strategic priority must be to constitutionally remove Barack Obama from the presidency of the United States. And following that, over the past week, there has been a widespread mobilization of LaRouche PAC activists from all around the country based on these marching orders, which included delegations of almost 50 people who came into Washington, D.C. from all over the East Coast to meet with their members of Congress, and uh, included among these delegations were two members of the LaRouche PAC Policy Committee, Rachel Brown and Diane Sayer. And Diane is joining us here in the studio tonight uh, to give an on-the-ground sense of what was accomplished in, in a bit more detail this week in Washington. Uh, but what I'll say is that this nationwide mobilization has completely uncorked the discussion around impeachment on Capitol Hill. And uh, it's really catalyzed a total explosion which can no longer be contained. Um, let me give a little bit of a chronology. Starting this Monday, uh, former Alaskan Governor Sarah Palin joined the chorus for impeachment, publishing an op-ed titled, It's Time to Impeach Barack Obama. Uh, and in this op-ed, she stated, quote, we should vehemently oppose any politician on the left or right who would hesitate in voting for articles of impeachment. The many impeachable offenses of Barack Obama can no longer be ignored, she said. If after all, if after all this, he is not impeachable, then no one is. Now, I highlight this not because of what Sarah Palin said, but because the following day, um, after Palin went on television to denounce Speaker Boehner for his planned lawsuit against Obama, uh, denouncing this as impotent in the face of a lawless imperial presidency, and again calling on Congress to fulfill its constitutional duties to file articles of impeachment, uh, during a press conference on Wednesday, House Speaker John Boehner was confronted with Palin's demands for impeachment, to which he lamely responded, I disagree. This first question on impeachment was then immediately followed up with a question uh, in which he was asked about other members of Congress from his own party who have openly come out and called for the impeachment of Obama. And all Boehner had to say to this was, again, I disagree. So. He thought he had gotten out of it. But then, again, the next day, on Thursday, Boehner was confronted with impeachment again at another press conference, uh, this time rejecting it not only twice, but thrice. In response to the first question, which again cited calls from Republican members of Congress for Obama's impeachment, Boehner once again very originally said, I disagree. And then when asked whether his premise for suing the White House, uh, that the president had, quote, refused to faithfully execute the law, wasn't in fact just an impeachable offense, Boehner said, well, others can make a determination about whether it's impeachable or not. And then finally, this press conference ended with the last questioner challenging him in his lawsuit tactic by saying, 
wouldn't a federal judge just say to you that uh, impeachment is the remedy, not a court injunction? And Boehner responded by saying, I believe that the path we're going down is the correct one and promptly ended the press conference. <laughs> so as you can see, however much Boehner has attempted to keep impeachment off the table, his strategy has certainly backfired. And impeachment is now on the agenda more than it ever was before. And uh, how is Obama responding to all of this? By saying, let it rip. He was uh, in Austin, Texas, giving a rip-roaring campaign speech, bragging about ruling the country through uh, executive decree with his 40-plus executive orders that he's issued since January uh, without the consent of Congress. And Obama referred to the calls for his impeachment. Uh, and putting on the cockiest voice that he could muster, he said, well, I don't have to run for office anymore, so let it rip. So I think that's probably one thing that we can agree with Obama on. When it comes to impeachment, let it rip. So uh, it's very clear that the genie is out of the bottle on impeachment and that the activity of LaRouche Pack has certainly succeeded in uh, catalyzing an avalanche in the direction of impeachment, which I think is going to be very difficult to stop. So in that context, Diane, I just wanted to ask you, from your perspective, both to give a sense of the breakthroughs that LaRouche Pack achieved this week, but also where do we have to go from here? Well, I think in that uh, press conference, Obama also began talking about himself in the third person, which is, <laughs> I guess he picks it up from the queen who he worships from afar. Um, at any rate, we are in a Berlin Wall type of moment. And what we are seeing across the nation at our literature tables, which are now famous, and many of you watching this are familiar with Obama with a little Hitler mustache, uh, we are now getting swarms of people signing up in areas where people used to freak out, areas, uh, working class, blue collar Democrats, people coming up, getting harassed by their friends and saying things like, I'm tired of defending this guy because I'm a Democrat or because I happen to be African American. I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm not going to defend him any longer. And so this I won't say culminated because I think this is going to continue to build, but this week in Washington we had delegations of activists who came in from Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Maryland, some people from Texas, uh, about 50 people all over Capitol Hill mobilizing around the impeachment and removal of Obama from office and the urgent necessity of instituting LaRouche's four laws to organize an economic recovery. and informing them about the fight that Argentina is waging against the Wall Street and British Empire's vulture funds, in which Argentina is being backed up by the majority of the world's population. Uh, and the response we got was very interesting. We were able to get a substantial number of impromptu meetings, that is, meetings where we didn't have a meeting set up with the office, but the activists were energized enough and aggressive enough to demand that someone meet with us. In the New York, New Jersey delegation, we also had six people who had been in the military service and some of whom were veterans of various wars. And this also had a substantial impact given the situation in Iraq, which is one of the factors that I think is pushing people over the edge. I also would say that this week, uh, 600,000 signatures were delivered to Elizabeth Warren's office and the U.S. Senate uh, more broadly in support of her 21st century Glass-Steagall Act. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the battle to bring down Wall Street to defeat the British Empire, which backs Obama, is coming to a critical point at the exact same time that the impeachment fight is coming to a crucial point. So you had the sense in D.C. when I was there, uh, almost every time you turned a corner to go into another 
corridor, you would see a group of LaRouche activists walking down the hall towards you. And I don't think that was missed on the Congress. And then outside, we had a banner which said, Argentina calls Wall Street's bluff. There is a limit to a tyrant's power. Impeach Obama. And we intersected dozens of congressmen there. And the second day that we were out, almost all of them were saying, I got this already. So we definitely saturated the place. Uh, I also wanted to just report on one thing that occurred today, because I think it's significant, particularly from the standpoint of Mr. LaRouche's point that the United States, for this to work, the United States has to return to its rightful place among a concert of nations. I and uh, Alicia Saratani were at a Brookings Institute discussion on the BRICS summit upcoming, and they had their Harvard-educated Anglophile experts on Russia, China, India, <laughs> etc., cetera, uh, to speak on this. And they were trying to mask a certain kind of hysteria uh, about what, how big this is that's coming together with a lot of jokes. Do the bricks have any mortar? Is this for real? Blah, blah. So uh, I was able to get in a question and referenced that the United States at the moment under Obama has has no credibility politically, starting with a very major deal, which is that our uh, CIA station chief has been expelled from Germany because we are spying on Germany, not just Merkel's cell phone, but uh, their discussions on what to do about our spying. We're spying on that as well. Uh, the situation of John Kerry's recent trip to China, where he came in and bragged about the success of the U.S. economy, and then a reporter who showed a map of all of our military bases encircling China, and Kerry, and, and the reporter asked about the U.S. encirclement of China, and Kerry accused the reporter of being a conspiracy theorist. And then the situation with Argentina, where the Supreme Court has ruled they have to pay the debt. and. Because of the dynamic in the world, Argentina is in a situation where they can say no. And our courts have absolutely no power to enforce their own ruling. Uh, so I went through these three situations, and then I said, do you think that the credibility and respectability of the United States might be restored if the, con if the Congress would do what's been discussed in Washington this week, which is impeach Barack Obama? And at that moment, everybody in the room sort of gasped and choked. And I thought they were not going to answer the question. But because it, it is really like a uh, ghost in the room of what's happening with the United States in relation to this, it was taken up uh, first by the China expert who said that he he said he would not agree with the, imp the premise of the impeachment of Obama, but certainly the United States has discredited itself with the budget crisis, et cetera. And then a woman who is, um, we've had run-ins with on previous occasions, uh, actually said, I'm glad you raised this question. She was very upset about what's happened with Germany. And she said, it is a question now, can the U.S. prove its ability to lead? And at the end of this, I, I spoke with people who said how glad they were that this had been raised. Mm -hmm. Now, this is completely different and is indicative of a, a completely different dynamic. And I think what uh, Matt was raising earlier about Boehner, mm -hmm. I'm glad you said uncorked, because I have this image of him as being a cork on the impeachment bottle and we are shaking the bottle <laughs> and and his lawsuit is going to end up exploding into a full-blown impeachment if we do, do our job and i would just say for everyone who's watching the congress is in session now through the end of july but they are also all going home for campaign and fundraising events and you should find them and you should tell them that they must move to impeach obama and institute larouche's four laws and that you know you know that they've gotten our literature because we've completely uh, saturated Capitol Hill, and then you should call your congressman and demand that they meet with the LaRouche delegations in Washington. But it, but it is a revolutionary moment, and we can expect major changes. Well, let me take up one thing that you mentioned, Diane, which is the showdown that's ongoing between Argentina 
and the Wall Street vulture funds and how this is playing into the situation in Washington. Um, as some of our viewers may know, Dennis Small did an interview earlier this week on the LPAC website in which he reported on the groundbreaking OAS meeting, the Organization of American States meeting that occurred in Washington last Thursday. And I'll refer people to that interview for all the details on this truly historic event. But one thing I'd like to highlight here are the remarks that were made at this meeting by the acting foreign minister of Guyana, Robson Ben, uh, which I'm sure will resonate with all of those who, are, who have been following these webcasts regularly. So let me have the first slide. What Mr. Ben had to say was the following. The international financial system and policy should revolve around the issue of not beggaring your neighbor, but prospering your neighbor. I would like to pose the question, perhaps, as to whether we should not, out of this imbroglio, relook at the overall question of the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999 in the United States, which related to the activity of the banking system, the international financial institutions, mainly resident in the United States and in the United Kingdom. President Roosevelt of the United States of America established a banking act, signed off on the Banking Act of 1933, which set up firewalls between the activities of the banks and on the questions of speculation in the financial system. There is perhaps the need now to take a look at putting back in place important sections of the Glass-Steagall Act, which was repealed in 1999. We know the devastation the dislocations in the United States economy in 2008 had even more devastating, dislocating effects in the world financial system. So we need to perhaps review the question or call upon U.S. legislators to pursue efforts to put back in place the type of regulation in the banking system which would prevent vulture funds which would prevent this response, whereby there is this form of what I call modern-day piracy. Modern-day piracy, which has serious implications for the world economy, and particularly now, in the case of Argentina, a very significant country in Latin America, severe implications for its economy, and which would create a cascading effect in Latin America, Central America, and elsewhere. Uh, Robeson Ben continued to say, Guyana stands in solidarity with Argentina in rejecting and condemning the actions of vulture funds and put in jeopardy progress made by these countries. The dilemma of the Argentine people and government resonates with all developing countries. It is the moral responsibility of all stakeholders, including the American people and their government, to ensure that countries such as Argentina which has made significant strides in improving their debt situation, not have to adopt measures which threaten the progress that has been achieved. So this is obviously a very significant statement which goes right to the essential point, calling on the U.S. Congress to act by restoring Glass-Steagall as a systemic means to address the global crisis and as the foundation of a new financial architecture, precisely what Mr. LaRouche has been calling for consistently as the, the crucial first step. Now, as people do know, and as Diane mentioned, there is a huge fight ongoing inside the U.S. Congress around Glass-Steagall, which LaRouche Pack has been responsible for catalyzing and leading. Um, in fact, this week, a coalition of labor and civic groups from around the country led by uh, Public Citizen and Americans for Financial Reform, delivered 600,000 signatures on a petition to the United States Senate calling for immediate action to restore Glass-Steagall. So the pressure is certainly on, but the question of why Congress continues to fail to act on Glass-Steagall, I think was addressed in a very direct way, ironically, by the Argentine Chief of Cabinet Ministers, Jorge Capitanich, in his press conference in Buenos Aires yesterday, uh, in which he discussed 
Wall Street's financial control over members of the House of Representatives in the United States Senate. Uh, speaking of the vulture funds, he said, they exhort the judges, they exhort, extort through their respective Congresses, through mafioso campaigns, because we know that in the Congress of the United States, they get their, uh, sorry, because we know that in the United States, a large part of the House of Representatives and Senate in the Congress of the United States get their financing from the vulture funds. And these then take advantage of countries precisely to make their exorbitant and extraordinary profits. We can in no way accept extortion. And the same point was made in a full page advertisement, the latest of which uh, in the Washington Post this week, which was bought by the Argentine government, in which they say uh, that the vulture funds have dedicated themselves in recent years to, quote, funding the campaigns of U.S. politicians. And this is certainly the case. As we highlighted in our previous webcast, Paul Singer, who is the owner of NML Capital, has been called the GOP's go-to guy on Wall Street, uh, Congressional Republicans' most powerful fundraiser, and some even call him, and he's proud of this title, a fundraising terrorist who often writes multi-million dollar checks to Republican super PACs uh, and contributes his criminal blood money to various members of the U.S. Congress, leading Republicans like Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, Mitch McConnell, surprise, surprise, John Boehner, um, as well as Chris Christie and other uh, prospective Republican presidential candidates, but also leading Democratic members of Congress. So when your congressman or senator tells you, I don't support Glass-Steagall, you can probably safely assume that they very well might be on the payroll of Paul Singer and his buddies. Now, my question for you, Dennis, um, and you touched on some of this earlier, that if you consider both this call by Guyana's foreign minister, Robeson Ben, for Glass-Steagall, in combination with the discussion now of a new, what you could call, international development bank, um, the sort that's forming around the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which China is fast-tracking, and also the so-called BRICS Bank, which is now on the agenda at the BRICS Summit this week in Brazil, which both President Putin and President Xi Jinping uh, will be attending. It's very clear that Mr. LaRouche's ideas are directly shaping the emergence of a tendency towards a new financial architecture on this planet. So in light of what I just went through, I think the question is, how can we break the stranglehold of the vulture funds and Wall Street over Congress here in the United States and force the necessary breakthrough on Glass-Steagall and the entirety of Mr. LaRouche's four-part uh, program so that the United States can take its rightful place as the necessary paragon of leadership in this new system of relations among nations. Well, for starters, it would be useful if uh, people understood a little bit more about the history of the United States and the principles on which this country were founded instead of believing the poppycock which the British Empire has been teaching us since 1776 and before as to what the principles are on which our economy and our political system are founded. Whenever you hear people say that this country is based on free market capitalism, defending property rights, and so on and so forth, you know that they are the victims of a British brainwashing operation. Because the fact of the matter is that the uh, idea of the United States on which it was founded was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness meant in the sense of what Leibniz describes as felicity, which we've discussed on previous webcasts. It was not founded on the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. That phrase, life, liberty, and property, was very famous in the history of the United States, except it happened to be the basis of the Confederate States of America. That is to say, 
the British-sponsored, slave-running, bestial operation to destroy the United States. So when you hear people talking about, oh, I know all about what the economy of the United States is based on. We're for free market capitalism. We're for free trade. We respect property rights. Well, yeah, Argentina's having some problems, but they got to pay. They, they borrowed that money. They've got to pay. Why? I, I even heard somewhere in my economics class that, that Adam Smith is the economist on whom our country's economic system is based. Well, I have some news for you. Adam Smith whose wealth of nations is considered his magnum opus, was an agent of British intelligence. And that book, which promotes free market and the uh, invisible hand and so on and so forth, which you've heard all about, was actually written and published in 1776. And it was written as a British diatribe against the American system because the Argentines have got it right. Property, as it is defined under these circumstances and these conditions, is not sacrosanct. Argentina is paying its debt. It is paying the debt which has been correctly restructured and renegotiated. They're simply opposed to paying the debt two, three, four, five times over again, killing off their population, which is, of course, exactly what's being demanded by the vulture funds. The vulture funds have not only uh, targeted Argentina. They specialize in picking on little guys, people who can't fight back, like African countries. And this was actually cited by the, uh, in, in the debate at the OAS that, uh, that I attended, which Matt is just mentioning, where the Venezuelan foreign minister, Hawa, recalled the fact that ML, NML Capital and these other vulture funds had a few years back picked on Congo Brazzaville. And they tried to collect $400 million and did collect that after having bought up the defaulted debt for pennies on the dollar for $3 million or something like that. And the question he asked is a very valid question. How many children could be saved with those $400 million? How much medicine could we have bought? How many lives could have been saved? And it is this principle, this principle of economics, that man and his creative powers is the primordial basis for economic prosperity and development, and that an economic system, and especially debts, have to be adjusted to that and not vice versa. This is the principle on which the United States was founded. This is what the Constitution says. And what people run around in the streets, you know, talking like they know what they're talking about, they're actually just repeating a bunch of British propaganda. It's as simple as that. The Pope has made exactly the same point that the Argentines are making as to the priority of uh, human lives over and above these so-called property rights. There have been numerous discussions of the question of property rights so-called throughout history. In a previous webcast, I'd mentioned the case of uh, the discussion of property during the American Civil War, because after all, slaves were considered property. And slaveholders had property titles far more credible, far more justified than what these vulture funds hold. In the case of Argentina, they bought defaulted debt literally for pennies on the dollar, and they're trying to collect on that with a return which over a few years amounts to 1,608%. Now, there's also a discussion of this in classic literature. Go back and read your Shakespeare. Read The Merchant of Venice. Portia had a thing or two to say to Shylock about this matter. What happens when you try to collect your pound of flesh? What are the consequences? We are responsible for the consequences of our actions, what the intention is. Now, on these vulture funds, what you were just saying, Matt, is absolutely the case, and this is well documented in terms of uh, the money that they uh, are spreading around the Congress of the United States, which indeed does have a lot to do with why they are cowardly on the question of impeachment, why they are cowardly on the question of Glass-Steagall, and why they repeat over and over again phrases like, I disagree. <laughs> well, he didn't disagree when he got a check from NML Capital, did he? <laughs> what about that, John Boehner? <clears throat> and what about the Democrats who have taken the money also, which is blood money? Look at what's going on in Detroit. Look at what's happening in Puerto Rico. These cities, these places have been destroyed economically by the exact same vulture funds. 
by the exact same ruses, by the exact same looting operation of hooking them on speculative capital, destroying the physical economy, and then reeling them in. And where's Detroit today? 50% of the population of Detroit can't pay their water bills. What are you going to tell them? The same thing the Argentines or Congo Brazzaville was told? Well, I'm sorry uh, that you don't have the money to do that, and you have to take that money out of what you're giving grandma to eat, but you know, you got to pay your bills. My mother told me you got to pay your bills. My mother told me our country is based on Adam Smith. 50% of the population of the Detroit can't pay their water bills. And the city of Detroit, under the control of these same vulture funds and speculators, are now planning to cut off the water. And it's so bad that the United Nations has gotten into the middle of the fray saying, hey, wait a minute, water is a human right. You can't cut off people's water unless they are intentionally not paying. Now, when the United Nations comes to lecture the United States on basic principles of economics, you know we'd better get our act together. We're in serious trouble. So this whole idea of <clears throat> property rights being primordial over everybody, everything else, this is a complete nominalist Aristotelian view of law. This is the idea that what's written on a piece of paper, just like Shylock had, I have a piece of paper here and that's what it says. I don't care if it kills you. Now, what Argentina is doing, there's another way to approach this thing. <clears throat> what Argentina is doing, <clears throat> excuse me, they did renegotiate their debt. They wrote it down partially by mutual agreement and restructured it. And on the basis of the economic policies they chose to adopt for growth to then be able to pay the debt, they're now meeting and have met absolutely on time completely all of the payments on the 93% of their bonded debt, which was restructured. The vulture funds represent 7% or less in the case of the ones that are suing, 1%. And they want to blow the whole thing up because of that. And the way Argentina did it, see, it's not a question of what you do with your debt, whether you write it down or you pay. All of those are monetary manipulations, which are secondary. The question is, what are the terms of the actual physical economy which are applied as a condition for that, that debt renegotiation? If you do it with the IMF, if you do it with the Troika, if you do it with the British Empire, their condition is kill yourself. The way Argentina did it was not unlike what Alexander Hamilton did in the case of the United States. He reorganized our debt too. He recognized the legitimate debt that we had. But the way he did that is he issued new government credit for the purpose of increasing the productive powers of labor. And we grew to pay the debt. The former president of Argentina, Nestor Kirchner, said, corpses can't pay their debts. We're going to pay by growing. And that's what Argentina has done. Just this last week, a United Nations economic body called the Economic Commission on Latin America, ECLAC, put out a report saying that Argentina's growth rate over the last eight years after their bankruptcy in 2001 was the highest rate of any country in the entire region in 50 years. So they grew. So there's a principle of economics here which is very, very important. And that is the same principle on which this country was actually founded, which is the Hamiltonian idea, which is the idea also expressed in the Monroe Doctrine, which is we don't want looting operations like the British Empire in the Americas. The famous Monroe Doctrine written by John Quincy Adams when he was Secretary of State under Monroe. And it was actually those ideas, in some cases, I think, really quite unbeknownst to the participants themselves, which guided the direction of the discussion at the OAS meeting. Not only the comments of the foreign, acting foreign minister of Guyana, Ben, similarly with the Venezuelans, who mentioned the Drago Doctrine, which was Argentina's restatement, effectively, of you cannot collect the debt by force, you cannot destroy a nation to do that, which he did in 1902, a, doct a doctrine which Drago himself described as the financial corollary of the Monroe Doctrine of the United States. And Drago was a close follower and referred to the great Alexander Hamilton. So this idea of the United States being a paragon to lead the world in the direction of the destruction of the British Empire is not a new idea. It's just a very necessary one. And it was that idea 
unbeknownst to many of the people there, which was actually what was moving the political process forward <clears throat> at the OAS meeting. Let me just conclude in response to this. Uh, much more could be said, but that now what comes up is taking this issue of Argentina much more broadly than simply in the nations of Ibero-America. What was expressed there generally was solidarity. That's good, but it's not enough. We are not going to destroy the British Empire by people expressing solidarity with Argentina's just cause. It's going to require kicking over the chessboard altogether. It's going to require bankrupting and replacing this financial system with a new one as per the specifications in LaRouche's four laws. And that is the kind of topic which is actually on the agenda at the BRICS meeting upcoming on July 15th in Fortaleza, Brazil. As Matt mentioned, with the presence of the Chinese and the Russian heads of state, each of whom will be visiting Argentina before, in the case of Putin, and after, in the case of Xi Jinping, the BRICS meeting. So I don't know that miracles will happen at that meeting, but there will be, in fact, an extremely important discussion around ideas to deal with a crisis which have been uniquely presented, in fact, by Lyndon LaRoche. Okay, so I, I'd like to ask a question turning to the issue of this bankrupt financial system specifically. Um, underscoring the fact that we are at the moment of total blowout of the transatlantic system. Uh, this week, in the recent week, we've seen some very significant developments, significant shocks in the banking system of Europe. Now, as a certain kind of prelude to this week, uh, we saw in the last days of June or a run on the banks of Bulgaria. We saw an announcement on July 3rd by Austria's Erste Bank that they expected losses of over 1.5 billion euros this year, both of which events set off a series of shocks throughout the Eurozone banking system, but also set off a series of hysterical denials that there is any systemic implications to these developments, including a reaction from the assistant editor of London's Telegraph, Jeremy Warner, who nervously insisted that uh, Austria's Erste Bank announcement uh, was, quote, not, he said this, the announcement of the bank was not quite the Credit Anstalt, the Austrian banking collapse that marked the beginning of the Great Depression, but he said it was still very worrisome in terms of the future of the entire European banking system. Now, that's the prelude. In just the past couple of days, the picture has become much, much more dramatic with the announcement of the insolvency of Portugal's third largest bank, the Banco Espiritu Santo, as well as its holding company, Espiritu Santo International, to which not only the Portuguese banks, but the major banks of Spain, the banks of France, including Credit Agricole, have serious exposure. Now, despite the denials of the bank, of the Portuguese government, and of the ECB that this has any systemic risk, the announcement of Banco Espiritu Santo has already set off major tremors throughout the entire European banking system, including yesterday the collapse of the bank's stocks in trading of over 20 percent, almost 20 percent, which induced the shutdown of trading. Uh, you have government bond yields, not just of Portugal's bonds, but of bonds such as Greek bonds and across the continent uh, having skyrocketing uh, interest rates. And uh, also th the wide discussion of the imminent threat to the entire system. So the genie is out of the bottle. Now, also last week on July 3rd, we saw the announcement of ECB head Mario Draghi <clears throat> that the ECB would be unleashing an unprecedented amount of monetary expansion, liquidity pumping, uh, which was expected to surpass the liquidity pumping of the U.S. Fed at the height of the bailout. So I think it's it's clear that we really are at the edge of blowout of the entire system, as Mr. and Mrs. LaRouche have been warning. Now, I want to add something else into the picture here on the breakdown of the transatlantic system, which Diane already referenced earlier, which is what we saw come out of Germany yesterday. The announcement that the German government, at the request of the German parliament, has asked that the CIA station chief at the U.S. Embassy leave the country. Uh, in the wake of the identification of not just one, but two spies passing information 
to the U.S. intelligence services. Now, Der Spiegel Online described that request of the German government as follows. They say, on a diplomatic level, it is no less than an earthquake and represents a measure that until Thursday would have only been implemented against pariah states like North Korea or Iran. It also underscores just how deep tensions have grown between Berlin and Washington over the spying affair. Now, this move obviously is unprecedented, and it demonstrates that there is a very rapid breakdown of the transatlantic system. So the question I'd like to ask you is, what is driving and determining the breakdown, and what does this have to do with the coming financial blowup? Well, if you don't want to be called a pariah state, we should get rid of our pariah president. And things would change very significantly. The, these German developments are extremely significant, and we did have the opportunity to discuss them today with Helga Zeplerusch, who uh, stated, who said that from a German point of view, she speaking as a German political leader, perspective that they have is that the United States has absolutely nothing to offer Europe today other than spying, coercion, blackmail, and wars. Oh, and an economic collapse too. So this spy case, this particular development with the expulsion of the head of the CIA desk in, in uh, Germany could well be the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of developments in that country. She said that Germany, despite Chancellor Angela Merkel, is actually interested in economic co cooperation with China and Russia and the rest of the world. But under the British Empire's control and under Obama, that is impossible. In other words, that is not available in the transatlantic sector. Now, to that evaluation of Mrs. LaRouche, I can add that there is good reason to believe, we could at least call it a probability, that the handiwork of what's going on in Germany, not only this current case of spying, but also the previous uh, disclosed activities of the NSA and spying on Chancellor Merkel's own cell phone, uh, this really does appear to be the handiwork of the CIA director, John Brennan. Um, John Brennan is very close to the Saudi government in ways that I do not wish to describe on this uh, webcast program, in case children are listening. <laughs> and that means he's very close to the British, because that's who the Saudis are. Brennan has played a role in the cover-up, at least, if not more than that, of every one of the 9-11 atrocities carried out against this country, the 2001 one, as well as the 2012 uh, developments in Benghazi. And he's played a principal role in these activities. So what's happened in the case of Germany is that a crisis has broken out onto the surface now that was brewing underneath. And this could well go in various directions, especially because of the economic catastrophe now going on that you were just describing. I'd like to recall for our listeners that Mr. LaRouche, in the immediate aftermath of the Europarliament elections a couple of months ago, had said that he foresaw that his forecast was that we would be witnessing a triad of nations in Europe breaking or showing signs of breaking or leaning towards breaking from the British Empire's transatlantic alliance. And he pointed to Germany in particular because of its historic tradition, as well as France, which showed it very clearly in the elections. And he also spoke about Italy, uh, although the signs there at the time were somewhat weaker. Now, in addition to the German developments this week in in, uh, in Europe, there is another two cases that I'd like to point to, which I think are exemplary of the same process underway. First, you should know that on July 1st, Helga Zeplerouche issued a statement, an urgent appeal to the governments of Europe, do you support Argentina or the criminal speculators? So that was just about a week ago. And in that statement, she says, the crucial question here is, is international law, as it evolved from the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, and as expressed in the UN Charter, still valid or not? Can and must a sovereign government defend the general welfare of its citizens? Or do criminal speculators have the right to use all means 
as Shakespeare depicted so vividly in The Merchant of Venice, to demand the debtor's pound of flesh, even if that means that the person dies. And she concluded saying, the only thing that the transatlantic camp has to offer is the sacrifice of the common good, of the happiness and the life of its people in favor of a Frankenstein monster, quote, the stability of the market, close quote, to which anything and everything should be sacrificed, but which is, which is itself hopelessly bankrupt. This system does exactly what Pope Francis says, it kills. You could also call it satanic. And she concluded saying, in the struggle between Argentina and the hedge funds, there is no middle ground. Which side are the European governments on? We want an answer. We want official statements now. Now with the vast majority of the world's countries and governments supporting Argentina in this life and death battle uh, against the vulture funds with the G77, which is 133 nations, China, Russia, now all of the nations of South America, all of the OAS, except for the United States and Venice and uh, Canada, which voted against it, total support. Europe has, up until now, been somewhat quiet and kind of caught in the crossfire here, as Europe generally feels under these circumstances. So in that regard, I think it's of some note that the Democratic Party of Italy, which is not some small party, this is the ruling party of Italy. And it's generally not a very good government. But the Democratic Party of Italy went on record as the first major such institution in Europe in support of Argentina under these circumstances. So it kind of broke the barrier. We'll see what comes next, but I'm fairly confident that Mrs. Zeplarouche's call is going to find a significant response on the European side. Now, Let's just take a quick look at the at some of the economic backdrop of this, which you were mentioning, Megan, which has to do with the this banking crisis. The the misnamed Espírito Santo, for those who don't speak Portuguese, that means the Holy Spirit, of which there is undoubtedly none at that bank, um, uh, is is really quite bankrupt. But it's not just Espírito Santo; it's the entire European banking system, as Mr. Larouche has been saying over and over again. It's Bulgaria, it's Austria, it's Portugal. The principal creditors of, of Portuguese bank debt are Spanish banks, which are probably more bankrupt than the banks they're trying to collect from. The whole thing is falling apart. And what LaRouche said earlier this week is that the big one is upon us. This thing is melting down now, and we must prepare in time. We have to have the bankruptcy reorganization in place now through Glass-Steagall and the other three laws which LaRouche has proposed, establishing a national bank. Uh, at, and, and issue credit in the national credit system as Hamilton uh, did so, and then driving the economy forward with high technology scientific breakthroughs, as in the case of fusion power, thermonuclear fusion power. These are the things that have to be done immediately. Now, if we take a look at the first uh, graph, which I prepared to show you for tonight, what you'll see is that the hyperinflationary expansion of financial instruments, which Megan was describing before, has really taken off over this recent period. And in particular, the role of the ECB, the European Central Bank, is filling in and then some for the so-called tapering going on at the, Fed, at the Fed. But the combined level of the two is eight, nine trillion dollars created since the blowout of 2008. Now, the argument, of course, is that money is uh, necessary because it's going to go to banks, which in turn are going to lend it, and that's going to lead to development, and businesses are going to prosper, and people are going to consume, and you're going to have a chicken in every pot, and everything is going to be wonderful. Is there bank lending going on? Next graphic, please. No, <laughs> there's not bank lending going on. As quantitative easing has increased across the transatlantic sector to more than $9 trillion, this includes Europe, the UK, and the US, over this period, actual bank lending has gone south, negative, over this entire period. And that's because all of the money is going to bail out the bankrupt financial system, which it's not going to be able to do with this, with this bailout type of approach. The bail-in approach, which the British Empire are, is proposing, of basically looting everyone till they're dry to bail out a handful of banks which they uh, choose to salvage, is also not functioning. And you have a situation where this whole thing is actually at the blowout point. Now, let me just emphasize a point here. The problem is not the issuance of credit. 
nine trillion dollars issued by the transatlantic sector the problem isn't that it issued a lot of credit the problem is that it issued a lot of credit which went to speculation china during the same period since 2007 has issued approximately six trillion dollars in credit that's two-thirds as much as the entire transatlantic sector but its credit went as specified in the American system of political economy, there are better Hamiltonians in China than there are in Washington. Because what they're doing is they are building canals, they're building railroads, they're building the Silk Road, they're participating with Africa, they're participating with Central America, all of Asia, they're offering it to Europe, and they're even offering it to the United States. So this gives you an idea of what the Hamiltonian concept actually is and the kinds of measures that need to be taken. The United States has got to get on board with this. And the way to do that is to get Obama out and get our country back to the policies on which it was originally founded. OK, this will be the final question of the evening. In response to the June 16th decision by the U.S. Supreme Court to uphold the ruling of federal court judge Thomas Grisa that Argentina must pay the vulture funds even over their own dead body, um, this decision, which was written by the notorious Justice Antonin Scalia, Lyndon LaRouche noted two things. One, he said immediately, the bailout and bail-in policy is in full play now, and the attack on Argentina has set this into motion. Now, the other thing he said is that Justice Scalia should be denounced for supporting genocide. Now, in an article published on June 27th in EIR on the ruling entitled, Will Argentina Be the First to Bolt from the Bankrupt System? The article opens as follows. In a decision written by Aristotelian idiot Justice Antonin Scalia, the United States Supreme Court on June 16th sided with the bloodiest of vulture funds, NML Capital and Aurelius Capital Management, in their effort to use American courts to gain discovery of all Argentine financial movements worldwide in order to seize that country's assets in payment for defaulted bonds. Now, from what you laid out earlier, Dennis, about the full implications of the Argentina situation, it is quite clear that Justice Scalia is an idiot. He's a dangerous idiot. He's a genocidal idiot. But my question to you is, why is he an Aristotelian idiot? Well, I don't know why he's an Aristotelian. That's something we'd have to ask him or his psychiatrist. <laughs> but but uh, I can tell you why we wrote that in the magazine. Uh, because the issue of Aristotelianism is actually central to this whole question that we've been discussing tonight and to the ruling and to the future of humanity. The, if you have a spare minute or two, you can read Scalia's ruling in this case. It, it's pure nominalist literalism, which kind of holds up, like Shylock, the piece of paper and says, you said you were going to pay. It doesn't matter that they bought uh, a piece of paper that says it's worth one billion dollars for one million dollars, you gotta pay. So what if the profit rate is a thousand percent? That's irrelevant. It says here on the paper you gotta pay. What it does is it banishes any concept in the justice system of justice. It banishes any concept of intention. There's no such thing as truth. The only thing that's presented are arguments that would pass a computer's spell checker. And that's probably what it did, although there may be typographical errors in there as well. I haven't checked that out. <laughs> but this is exactly what Aristotle does. What Aristotle does is he banishes from his system and tries to project this onto the actual political results. He banishes the existence of mind. He says that the only thing which actually exists is sense perception. And this has its consequences. Let's take a look at this first quote from uh, Aristotle, which is taken from his work De Anima, which is, I mean, that's sort of a misnomer, just like Spiritu Santo is a misnomer for the bank. De Anima means on the soul, which Aristotle denies exists. So here he is writing on the soul. Well, you'll see why. Aristotle says, perceptions are always true. It is intellect that introduces errors. 
things are first separate, in other words, you look at the pieces first, and then conjoined. In all cases, falsity occurs in conjunction, and it is intellect that affects the unity. So turn off your thinking cap. Don't try to come up with an idea that explains the sense perceptions around you. Limit what you say you know to that which you perceive. And his concept of man reflects exactly this. In the same document, in De Anima, Aristotle says we should never ask why. Why is the wrong question to ask. Because you don't know why. All you know is that something happens or doesn't happen, supposedly. Now, this has certain consequences if you look at this in terms of the economy, because what happens to an economy if you banish mind? If you say simply, the only thing you know is that which you perceive? Well, you have a situation like we have today, where you have no technology, you have no science, you have no advance, you have nothing that's an actual solution to the crisis which we're facing. You simply adhere everything to the nominal monetary value on a piece of paper, regardless of the actual consequences that that will have for the future of the human species. This is a green paradise. This is exactly what the greenies want to do. Everything is banished that could actually save the situation because without an advance in thermonuclear fusion, without applying technology massively on a global scale, we are going to end up with what the British Empire wants, which is genocide of six out of seven billion people on this planet. And that is why Mr. LaRouche referred to Scalia and his decision as a genocidalist. Now also look at the question of the consequences of this view for law in the area of law. Because what this means is that there's no such thing as an actual concept of justice, of the good to be sought, that man has a moral purpose. Man is not guided by anything moral or purposeful or intentional about bettering the condition, the common good, the general welfare, and so on. Not at all. Man is guided, Aristotle tells us, by hedonism by the law of the jungle, by pleasure and pain, by the idea that might makes right, by the idea that Cheney and Obama have presented quite clearly of the unitary executive. I decided it, it's right. You don't like it? Let it rip. Bring it on. <laughs> These are the signing statements of Obama. He's violating the Constitution, like I said, up and down State Street. And that comes from exactly this concept of law. And this is what you would see in, and you do see in Scalia's court. Now, look at what uh, Aristotle has to say about this, on this question of justice and morality. This is from another writing called the Nicomachean Ethics, in which he says, the whole subject of moral virtue and statecraft is bound up with the question of pleasures and pains. For if a man employs these well, he will be good. If badly, bad. We have now sufficiently shown that moral virtue consists in observance of a mean, of holding a middle position between two vices. As it is hard to hit the exact mean, we ought to choose the lesser of the two evils. So if you ever wondered where that obnoxious and offensive phrase comes from, of choosing the lesser of two evils, sort of like voting for which of the two candidates are running in the election, both of them getting a paycheck from Paul Singer of NML Capital, you can thank Aristotle. That's where it came from. Mm -hmm. And what is Aristotle's concept of man? Again, the Nicomachean Ethics, the last quote from, from uh, Aristotle, he says, to argue that man is superior to the other animals is beside the point. For there are other things more divine in the universe even than man. Well, clearly, if you define man as being nothing but a uh, basically complicated computer that receives computer messages and, and sense certainty, but there's no actual thinking, no reason, no creativity, therefore no morality, well, if that were man, then it would in fact be the case that uh, that is not the superior thing in the universe. But he's wrong, obviously. So this is what mathematics actually is, because Aristotle, if, if this is what the reality is, and this is what truth is, as described by Aristotle, merely sense perception, then you can perfectly describe 
the categories of sense perception and everything that you perceive under a mathematical formula because there's nothing outside that mathematical representation as such. There's nothing additional added to it. There's no uh, intellectual activity, no intuition as Nicholas of Cusa later refers to it. So anything outside of mathematics is considered to be metaphysics, i.e. it's not real, it's made up. So anyone who thinks in a mathematical fashion, strictly mathematical fashion or Aristotelian fashion, is in fact thinking in a way where the concept of man is going to conclude in genocide. That's a simple fact of the matter, whether mathematicians like it or not, that's the truth of the matter. Now, it turns out that when you try to describe the world in strictly mathematical or Aristotelian terms, you run into paradoxes, uncountable paradoxes, because lo and behold, a mathematical system can't actually explain itself. So for example, this is a famous one, right? I would like you to tell me if the following sentence that I'm about to utter is true or false. Ready? Here's the sentence. This sentence is false. Well, from the standpoint of mathematics, that's an utter paradox. From the standpoint of reality, it simply means that a mathematical system cannot comment on itself from outside the system. It's incapable of reflecting a process of actual change. And this points to this little paradox, of which there's a million that could be cited, um, points to what the actual underlying issue is here. Now, compare this issue to that presented by Nicholas of Cusa, who says that mind is a substantial form of power, and therefore it is called the soul. Now, Cusa commented on Aristotle as well. Uh, in one of his writings called The Not Other, he asks himself, well, what did Aristotle discover? He says, well, to confess honestly, I do not know. <laughs> now, what he also says is the following, if I could have the next slide. Cusa, the great Renaissance genius who was the founder of modern science and who incidentally has everything to do with the founding of the United States, said the following. Aristotle says that to understand is an accident. But something is present, says Cusa, to mental intuition or to reason, which was not present to sense. Mind is a living measure which achieves its own capacity by measuring other things. Mind is not of the nature of changeable things which it grasps by sense perception, but of unchangeable things which it discovers in itself. This is from Cusa's The Layman on Mind. And therefore, he concludes, mind is a living substance. Its function in this body is to give it life, and because of this, it is called soul. Mind is a substantial form of power. Now, what is your concept of economics and of man and of the universe and of the creator if your view is that mind is a substantial form of power? Well, you will then provide a solution to this crisis based on that substantial form of, of power, which is the actual scientific and technological advances which are necessary to wipe out the British Empire uh, and, the, and the disaster that's going on today. This is very much the same idea that was presented on the Russian side in Vladimir Vernadsky. He addresses exactly the same issue where he says, thought is not a form of energy. How then can it change material processes? So with that, I return to the opening question, which is US-Russian relations and what Mr. LaRouche said about that, which is that a Russia guided by Vernadsky and Vernadsky's thinking and his philosophy with a United States returning to being a paragon of the kind of thinking reflected in Nicolas of Cusa is exactly the sort of relationship it, among sovereign nations which is required to get this world out of the mess that it's in. Aristotle is going to have to go, and the equivalence of Aristotle that the, some of the Russians cherish, we must return to Cusa and Vernadsky and these ideas. And I would like to conclude my remarks with a quote <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, from one of the founding fathers of the United States. And I want you to listen to this. And it's on the screen. What he said was, our knowledge of physical nature 
such as it is, consists entirely of inferential corrections of the testimony of the senses. When we sit down to astronomical calculations, we discover the truth, the triumph of inference over the senses. Intellect not residing in matter, but molding and controlling it. What is that intellect, and where is it? Everywhere in its effects, nowhere perceptible to the sense. That it modifies and governs the physical world is apparent both to my senses and my reason. Now that is a statement that was written in 1817, two days before John Quincy Adams returned to the United States to become Secretary of State. After a meeting he had with Jeremy Bentham, who was an Aristotelian if ever there was one, in which he was describing the problems. This is John Quincy Adams. This is the man who wrote the Monroe Doctrine. This is the basis for the United States returning to being a paragon, as Mr. LaRouche was saying from the outset, for creating an entirely different world based on what man actually is. Well, I want to thank Dennis very much. Um, I want to thank Diane Sayer also for joining us tonight and Megan Beats. And thank you all very much for watching. This is a conclusion to our webcast tonight. Good night. <laughs>